thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to all. Thank you for joining this webinar. So today we are going to talk about vaccination in developing countries, uh, challenges and solutions. And uh, we will spend the next hour or so talking about the importance of vaccinations in countries like India. We'll also talk a little bit about the challenges that vaccination at this scale imposes and some solutions. And then towards the end, I will also touch on a little bit about what Hilleman Labs is doing uh, to address this problem. So to kick off, we will start with some facts about vaccines and immunization. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to say that vaccine uh, is, is a huge opportunity if in terms of the amount of money that vaccination saves. This number runs into billions of dollars. Um, the burden and the impact of not vaccinating our children is also enormous. Uh, by some estimates, each year we lose 25 million children because we're not able to vaccinate them. Uh, the good news is that if you look at the history of vaccines uh, over the years, mankind has been able to eradicate diseases like smallpox, and we're almost at the verge of eradicating polio, with the exception of perhaps two or three countries. Um, we have very effective tools available to us in terms of simple, safe, and effective vaccines. Um, and uh, the even better news actually is that as time goes by, the cost of procuring these vaccines, the cost of immunization also is going down. And uh, that is reflected by a number of vaccine products that have become more and more affordable over the years. And yet we know that there are some challenges and we'll talk about those. So to get into some uh, specifics as far as uh, the introducing the topic, um, first I'd like to say that infectious diseases are a major cause of death and uh, disability in uh, children uh, and also in adults. Uh, and in small children, children less than five years of age, uh, this disability and deaths mostly is around enteric diarrheal diseases and also the infections of the low respiratory tract. Uh, we do have a number of interventions that are available, uh, improved sanitation systems, clean water, etc. cetera. Uh, but it's obvious that over the last 40 plus years, uh, those tools themselves actually have not uh, been uh, helpful um, and we need we need vaccines as well uh, and and that's where the importance of this topic comes in um, <clears throat> so we have important tools available and these tools uh, when used in the right way can make a huge difference uh, what is really needed is not just the utilization of these tools uh, but also more investment uh, in R&D that is, that is needed. Now, the, uh, the reach of vaccines in developing countries is uh, quite substantial. As I mentioned, as mankind, we've actually successfully eradicated smallpox. There's been a very dramatic reduction in the disease, in the incidence of diseases like uh, measles over the past several decades, and we're almost at the verge of eradicating polio, uh, with the exception of maybe two or three countries, such as Nigeria, Afghanistan and, and Pakistan. Uh, and yet, uh, the, despite these developments, there is an urgent need uh, to reach all the children across all geographies. Uh, and unfortunately, by some estimates, one in five children worldwide uh, is not adequately protected by the most basic vaccines. And that results in a very large number of unnecessary uh, preventable deaths uh, in the range of 1.5 million children that die each year. Uh, because of vaccine preventable diseases. Now the good news as I mentioned is that the reach of vaccines in uh, developing countries has actually improved quite substantially. Um, and if you look at the graph that is uh, being shown on your screens right now, uh, you see some very interesting trends. If you look at the bottom of the graph, uh, you see uh, vaccines for diseases such as polio, uh, DTP, measles, uh, tetanus, hepatitis B, and so on and so forth. Uh, and what you see is that the worldwide coverage um, in terms of vaccines for these diseases is actually quite high in the range of 80% or higher. But progressively, as you start looking at newer vaccines that have only been uh, available in recent years, so things such as pneumococcal conjugate vaccine or rotavirus vaccine, uh, here you see that the numbers drop uh, very sharply. 
So we are actually less than, let's say, 50% uh, in some cases and less than 20% coverage in the case of rotavirus. So, so the point here is that with established vaccines, older vaccines, we're doing pretty well, but where we are not doing well is in the introduction of new vaccines. And we need to solve that problem because at the end of the day, when a child dies, uh, it really doesn't matter whether they die of measles or whether they die of uh, rotavirus. Uh, it is ultimately a death that can be prevented. Um, the, this slide here talks about the, uh, the burden of unimmunized, uh, non-immunizing our children. Uh, so we're talking about more than 30 million children around the world that go without uh, immunization. And, and I think the striking statistic that is shown here in this slide is that uh, of all those children who go without vaccination, 60%, so 6 out of 10 children, live in just 10 countries, of which India is one. Uh, so what this tells us is that you know, we, we need some focused, targeted approach, not just in the developing countries, but even within the developing world, there are some countries uh, that represent the lion's share of this uh, unmet need. And so we therefore need to do a much better job uh, in those countries. Uh, I mentioned that when you look at children less than five years of age, the big burden of disease is due to uh, enteric diseases. So these are diseases that are spread through contaminated food and water through the uh, oral fecal uh, uh, administration. Um, and uh, this particular uh, cause of death and morbidity is quite high across the world and you see some statistics here in terms of the uh, number of deaths, the uh, disability adjusted life years uh, is also very high um, and uh, there are a handful of pathogens that are collectively responsible uh, for these diseases, things like rotavirus, ETEC, Shigella, uh, Campylobacter, Salmonella, uh, and, and, and others. Um, in the developing world, we have contaminated food, we have contaminated water that uh, is responsible. In the developed world, uh, also, these are foodborne illnesses that spread amongst children and also amongst uh, travelers uh, that uh, travel to these countries. Uh, this is an example of rotavirus, and uh, you can see that uh, if you go back about 10 years or so, 2006, 2007, the use of rotavirus vaccines across the world was actually quite low, and the burden of disease was very, very high. A very large number of children died unnecessarily because of rotavirus infection. What you see over the years, of course, is that the use of uh, rotavirus vaccines has increased. Um, quite nicely, uh, although there is much more work to be done. And as a result of this increase of the use of vaccines, the number of deaths uh, is actually reduced uh, quite significantly. Uh, we, we obviously need to do a much better job at this. Uh, here's an example of, of cholera, which is another uh, enteric disease spread through uh, contaminated water. Um, and what's interesting here is that if you look at the world map, and you look at the blue areas, and that's where cholera is endemic, uh, you find that there's only uh, specific regions in the world. For example, Sub-Saharan Africa, you see parts of Asia, India also, uh, the Bengal Delta, Bangladesh, and some of the neighboring countries where the incidence of cholera is, is very high. The problem with diseases like cholera is that uh, they can spread very quickly from one place to the other. And uh, the other interesting thing about cholera is that this is a uh, pathogen that actually lives in, in our environment. Um, and so therefore, anytime you have a natural disaster, such as a flood or an earthquake uh, or a tsunami, or if you have civil unrest, conflict, war, uh, cholera is actually one of the first diseases that you see. And this is what we saw in Haiti a few years ago. Uh, this is what we now see in places like Syria, in Yemen, in Somalia, um, and in Nepal that just had an earthquake. Uh, so this is a very deadly disease uh, that spreads very easily. The good news is that we have good vaccines available and we need to use those more effectively. Now, having presented a, a little bit on the uh, unmet need and the burden of uh, diseases, let's talk a little bit about the barriers and the challenges. 
And I'll just start off by showing a, a list of uh, barriers that have been known uh, to vaccine administrators. Um, and uh, there is a, a large number of reasons as to why immunization coverages in developing countries have traditionally been low. Uh, but I'll point your attention to the top two or three reasons which are at the top of the graph here. And really what you see at the very top is the problem or the barrier that there is limited awareness and misunderstanding. So people don't understand, people living in poor societies in rural settings don't quite understand exactly what vaccines are, what are the benefits, and, and what are the risks of not immunizing your children uh, with vaccines. And, and that is really by far uh, the biggest challenge. And then progressively as you uh, go further down the list, you see uh, uh, limited resources, you see a lack of infrastructure, lack of surveillance data, um, and at the very bottom then uh, an issue that vaccination is often not integrated into medical care practice. So all of these issues combined uh, create some barriers in terms of vaccine coverage. Oh, we, we can talk a little bit also about challenges in vaccine delivery uh, and there's a very large number of points uh, mentioned here and I'll just very quickly uh, touch on them. Uh, so we begin with high prices of new vaccines, the fact that a lot of these vaccines are actually not affordable to most public health programs. Uh, we can talk about the geographies and how many of the rural populations live in very isolated areas. So therefore, uh, distribution and delivery becomes uh, an effect, a lot of wastage that happens. Uh, we don't have ad adequate R&D for vaccines that are better adapted to the needs of the developing countries. We have uh, limited buying power because income levels are low. We have cost issues. Uh, we have weak healthcare systems. We have limited capacity for cold chain. Um, and ultimately, the uh, confidence in vaccines is not high because people don't quite understand the value and uh, they don't quite understand what are the risks if one does not uh, actually immunize themselves and their children. Uh, so this is a, a set of challenges. If you ask the question, what can we do to fill the gap uh, in terms of the supply of vaccines, uh, in countries like India, we actually have a pretty good system in place uh, when it comes to storage capacity. At a national level, we have a very large number of cold chain uh, storage points, more than 27,000. We have good infrastructure. Um, now, where we are lacking a little bit is, is in maintenance. Uh, you know, a number of our supply chain uh, points are not well maintained, and so there is an issue there. Uh, vaccine management is an issue. Uh, distribution is a challenge, particularly when you're talking about a very large country like India, uh, which is uh, not only big, but also is very heterogeneous. Uh, and there is people living in very, very rural and remote areas. So therefore, uh, distribution and delivery of vaccines uh, becomes a challenge. Uh, and ultimately also, the systems and procedures for maintaining or managing the stocks uh, are effective, uh, but the, in the next slide will tell, tell you a little bit about what happens when we actually add more vaccines or new vaccines into the system. So what's been happening, of course, over the last several years is that uh, in addition to the existing vaccines that we have in our systems, we are actually adding new vaccines. Uh, and each year there are new recommendations made by the WHO um, and uh, new vaccines are being added. Uh, we did this uh, in India also a few years back with the addition of vaccines like rotavirus and pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. Um, and what this does is that the supply chain uh, that I just described a minute ago, uh, which is quite good in, in countries like India, but it suddenly begins to uh, undergo a lot of pressure and a lot of stress. And, and this is where things become problematic. Uh, so it just becomes a question of how do we deliver on existing vaccines, but can we actually bring more vaccines into the system? And that's not such a straightforward thing. So how do we improve the immunization coverage? Uh, obviously, this is a complex question and a complex task. Uh, but there is a few things that we uh, as a uh, set of stakeholders can do uh, to address this issue. Uh, First and foremost, uh, we can do more to drive the demand. 
uh, for vaccination by improving the awareness and the education and the outreach on the value of vaccines. Uh, unfortunately, there continue to be a few myths uh, that exist about vaccines uh, in certain societies, and we can do more to correct those myths. Uh, we can improve access to all vaccines and ensure that supply and delivery is good by improving our infrastructure. Uh, we can work on tracking and monitoring on the demand and supply so that we don't end up in situations where suddenly there's an outbreak of a disease somewhere and we don't quite have adequate supply of vaccine even though uh, uh, there might actually be uh, vaccines available but uh, there's a gap in the supply chain. We can do more to improve the systems uh, that are systems-based intervention to eliminate uh, missed opportunities to vaccinate. And, and finally, we can create uh, collaborative models between providers and public-private partnerships to facilitate and, and promote immunization. So there's really a number of things that we can do uh, as, as a set of stakeholders and as a community uh, to improve the vaccination coverage. Um, when it comes to solutions for better access to immunization, uh, there are some additional considerations that I'd like to touch on. Uh, first thing I'd like to say is that we as a country, we as a community need to invest more in, in R&D. Uh, we have the benefit that global uh, charities uh, and philanthropies such as the Gates Foundation have invested uh, literally hundreds of millions and indeed billions of dollars in the R&D for new vaccines and that's a very commendable uh, effort uh, and it's a very, very significant effort. Uh, but we need more. Uh, we need governments to actually do this. We need we need societies to do that, do this. We need other stakeholders to do this because it's not possible for a single uh, uh, entity, a single charity or a philanthropy, uh, no matter how much money they might have, to address all of the R and D needs and the gaps that we have. In addition to that. We also need new strategies. Uh, there's a variety of new procurement and supply strategies that need to be explored. Uh, and one of the most developed is the advanced purchase contract, uh, which has actually worked quite well for certain vaccines, such as the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. It has allowed the prices of these vaccines to come down through the uh, uh, use of advanced uh, purchase contracts. Uh, and finally, we need to invest in development and introduction of newer vaccines. Uh, and I mentioned this earlier, and I'll say it again, that uh, in some cases, such as uh, the hepatitis B vaccine, unfortunately, it has taken as much as 20 years for this vaccine to reach the developing world uh, once it was introduced in the developed world. Uh, and and uh, now we are seeing that this gap is actually reducing certainly with rotavirus and also with pneumococcal conjugate vaccines. Uh, we have seen inter introduction, which has been sooner, and we need more of that because there are newer and newer vaccines that are actually becoming available. In the final minutes, I'll just quickly introduce uh, my organization, that is Hellman Labs, and about what we are doing and how we are trying to address this gap in vaccine immunization and what are we doing in terms of some of our uh, initiatives. So Hilleman Labs, uh, we are a global vaccine uh, research and development organization. Uh, we are focused on developing affordable vaccines for global health. And we do this in two ways. Uh, the first is that we take existing vaccines and we adapt them, we engineer them, we optimize them, we make them more suitable for the needs of the developing world. Uh, and the second is that we work on new vaccines in, in areas where uh, there, there are no existing vaccines. We act as a catalyst. We are a product-focused company. Uh, we use new technologies. We use innovation uh, to bring novel vaccine products to the market. And uh, it is important for us to uh, use a collaborative model uh, to do this, and, and, and that's how we actually work. So our focus is to innovate, uh, to optimize, to provide more access, uh, to make the vaccines more affordable, uh, and to make them uh, available to the most uh, uh, poor communities around the world. At the moment, Hellevin Labs is working on a uh, handful of different vaccines for uh, small children and is also for adults. Um, 
our focus is actually on enteric diarrheal diseases, but we're also working on, on other diseases. Uh, in the enteric diarrheal disease area, we have uh, development of heat-stable rotavirus vaccine, which is currently undergoing clinical trials. We also have an oral cholera vaccine, which is a very affordable vaccine that is also undergoing clinical development. In addition to that, we have vaccine development in areas where at the moment there are no approved vaccines anywhere in the world, and that's for diseases such as Shigella and uh, diarrhea caused by ETEC. Um, and we're doing this as collaborations. Our Shigella vaccine is a collaboration with NYSED in Kolkata and with ICMR, uh, and our ETEC vaccine is a collaboration uh, with the Sanger Institute in the UK. Uh, finally, we are also working on a uh, meningitis vaccine. This is a pentavalent meningococcal ACYWX conjugate vaccine, uh, which we're developing as a low-cost vaccine for treatment of invasive meningococcal disease. Uh, so at Hillerman Labs, we use innovation, we use technology uh, to develop affordable vaccines. We're working on uh, enteric diarrheal disease vaccines, but also vaccines uh, for other uh, indications and we do this in a partnership because our goal in the end is to develop vaccines for global health and we think we cannot do it alone, we need to do it together. And uh, we think that vaccines are the biggest uh, intervention that a society can provide to protect the health and the welfare of its citizens. Uh, and this is a unique opportunity and we feel that this week, being the, the immunization week, World Immunization Week, uh, there's no better message uh, than this to communicate to the global community uh, that vaccines are safe, vaccines are effective, vaccines are necessary. We need to embrace them and we need to find ways to make them more affordable and more accessible uh, to the poorest people living around the world. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and your participation and open this webinar up for questions. Thank you. So, uh, moving to questions. The first question is from Vibhu. He's referring to the slide pi. His qu uh, question is, do you think this calls for involvement of or better coordination between manufacturers and government agencies as well as for increasing the vaccine reach? Uh, yes, uh, without a doubt. Uh, I think this is an excellent question. Um, I think that the coordination between manufacturers and government agencies is uh, extremely important. And I think what's, what's important to recognize what each of those parties brings to the table. Now, what, va what va vaccine manufacturers are good at, of course, is all the know-how, all the technology, the scale, uh, and the expertise from the clinical regulatory manufacturing side. And that's the expertise that they bring to the table. Uh, vaccination is a public health issue and ultimately the responsibility for that, although it's everyone's responsibility, but in the end the lion's share of that responsibility falls on the government. So in terms of policy, in terms of uh, incentives, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of priorities, those are things that the government has to set. So I think that in this case it's an, an ideal partnership in which industry and government needs to uh, go hand in hand. Uh, and I think that uh, both uh, shareholders, both stakeholders need to take input from each other. And I think that where industry uh, seeks help from the government is improving some of the regulatory issues, improving some of the delivery aspects, uh, making some of the procurement uh, policies easier for them. And where the government is looking to industry is more innovation, more R&D, uh, affordable uh, products, high quality products and, and also products that are uh, available in sustained supply and developed for the uh, needs of the developing countries and that's what the government is looking for. So without a doubt this is a partnership, it's a very important partnership and I think we've seen some very good examples where this partnership has really worked well uh, but we need to see more of it. The second question is from Shivani. How will investing in PPP help in accelerating development and introduction of new vaccines? Well, as I just mentioned, uh, because vaccination is such a multifaceted and a multi-stakeholder issue, um, I think that the public-private partnerships are really at the core 
of not to, not just the innovation at the front end, at the R and D end, but also also at the at the uh, delivery end. Uh, when we have a set of emerging diseases, and over the last many years, we have seen a whole host of issues that have emerged, uh, not just things like dengue, but also uh, Zika, Ebola, and so many others. Uh, when these things happen, um, it becomes a, a bit of an issue in terms of who really takes the lead and who actually takes the, uh, uh, makes the effort to make sure that uh, there is some uh, type of a solution, public health solution that's available. I strongly feel that if we invest more in public-private partnerships, if we create, create the right funding models and if we create the right incentives, uh, then that investment in public-private partnerships will not only help uh, to ensure that our existing vaccines are being utilized and are being implemented in the best possible way, uh, but it will also ensure that when we are confronted with new and emerging epidemics, uh, that we are prepared. Uh, and, and that can only be done through uh, incentivization, funding, and uh, uh, policy decisions to ensure that we have a thriving uh, public-private partnership model because uh, ultimately, the, given the complexity of the problem, uh, that's really the only way it will work. So that, that incentivization and resourcing is actually quite important. Next question is from Shreya. How is Hillman's rotavirus vaccine different from existing one? Why do we need a new one? Uh, Good question. Thank you. Uh, Hillman's rotavirus vaccine is different from existing vaccines in, in many ways. Uh, first and foremost, uh, this is a, a rotavirus vaccine which is completely heat stable. Uh, the heat stability of this profile uh, of this vaccine is so strong that it has the potential to be completely kept out of the cold chain. And as I just mentioned, that the cold chain capacity and cold chain distribution becomes a huge problem. Uh, in developing countries, and uh, our vaccine actually offers that. Secondly, this is a very affordable vaccine, uh, and uh, it is something that is uh, uh, safe, uh, and also it is very uh, designed in a way that it's very easy to store and very easy to uh, deliver. And so when you look at a country like India, which has uh, 27, a birth cohort of 27 million children, so in India, you have one child that is born every 1.2 seconds. Uh, you, could, you look at the challenge in terms of making sure that all of these children are vaccinated. You talk about rotavirus vaccination. Uh, it's a huge, huge burden. So if you have a vaccine product which uh, doesn't require any complicated storage, complicated distribution, it is safe, it's affordable, it's easy to administer, you can imagine that the uh, delivery of such a vaccine product becomes so much easier, so much uh, effective. And that's what Hilleman Labs heat stable rotavirus vaccine brings to the uh, global uh, uh, vaccination uh, community. And uh, as, as someone very famously said, uh, uh, vaccines do not save lives, vaccination does. And Hilleman's heat stable rotavirus vaccine is designed exactly to do that. It's, de it's designed to increase the uh, use of vaccination uh, because of the way it is actually designed and the way it's optimized. And so in that respect, it's quite unique and quite different from the other vaccines that are available in the uh, public health community. Next question is from Harsh. How will heat-stable vaccine help? Isn't it a deviation from vaccine development R&D? No, it's not a deviation at all because, uh, you know, one of the unique things about vaccines is that these, these are very, very complex uh, medicines. They're very different from traditional medicines that you take. So their manufacture is complex, but even once they are manufactured, they have to be stored in a very unique way. So most vaccines have to be kept in the, in the fridge uh, in, a cold, in a cold condition or a cold environment. Uh, some, anywhere between 2 Celsius to 8 Celsius, that's the environment. If you take it out of that environment, these vaccines actually lose their potency. So actually designing a vaccine or optimizing a vaccine to become stable 
to heat is, is a very, very important consideration because you can imagine that there are parts of India where there are no fridges, there's no refrigeration, there's no cold storage, uh, there's no electricity, there's no maintenance, there's no training. So imagine a product that you don't have to keep in those types of conditions, yet you can actually uh, carry it with you and you can go to all the different rural areas, you can go to urban slums and you can provide this vaccine quite easily to children and think about the impact that that makes uh, both in terms of access but also uh, the savings in the costs uh, associated with delivery. So uh, designing vaccines to be stable against heat uh, is a very, very important consideration uh, and it's something that we are doing with not just the heat stable rotavirus vaccine but we are applying our heat stable technology to other vaccines that I talked about also that includes the vaccines for cholera, shigella, ETEC and the meningitis vaccine. Next question from Sonal. We all know vaccines save millions of lives yet you mentioned that immunization infrastructure remains insignificantly underfunded. Why is it so? There are many reasons for that. Uh, I think one of the reasons is the uh, uh, policy and the priority. Uh, I think that uh, uh, vaccines and immunization unfortunately uh, are not always at the top of the priority of the policy makers and the decision makers. Um, and I think that if there was more emphasis on vaccines and immunization there would be more uh, resources, more money that would be allocated uh, and I think the good news is that in recent years we have seen a change uh, in that trend uh, but I think no more needs to be done. I think the other issue of course is that uh, uh, as time goes by we have more innovative vaccines that are being made available so with each the introduction of each vaccine uh, the existing system becomes more and more burdened so unless we maintain our existing system or unless we expand upon it the addition of uh, new vaccines becomes a problem uh, and finally what I would say is that uh, uh, in recent years we have also seen uh, an outbreak of diseases that we had never heard of before, things like Ebola, things like Zika and others. So we are living in times where uh, even though countries have existing infrastructure, that infrastructure is already under a lot of pressure and in addition to that we're seeing new and emerging diseases. So if you put it all together it becomes quite obvious that uh, the priority for vaccines and immunization must be high and it must be in the focus and policymakers uh, should uh, keep this in mind when they uh, uh, make decisions on the types of resources and the budgets and the allocation that is made. Next question is from Dinesh. As per my experience to vaccination program in India the most challenging to accept acceptance by community due to AEFI drop rate are so high for vaccination how we can overcome through new te technologies? Yes, yeah, so I think that this is an area where uh, there are some technologies that uh, could be could be very helpful. I think at a, at a broad level I think that we just need to do a better job in terms of creating awareness and advocacy in the safety of vaccines and the importance of vaccines and also to dispel some of the myths. Uh, I think at a broad level that becomes very, very important because sometimes it is misinformation that creates uh, a lot of problems. So we just need to do a better job at that. But I think in a country like India, I would say that we have uh, mobile phone technology that is extremely powerful and it's extremely helpful. Uh, this is a country that is moving more and more towards the digital age uh, and we have seen how in many facets of our life we're moving uh, away from our traditional approaches of transaction to digital approaches. I see no reason why those technologies could not be uh, implemented to create more awareness and to educate people uh, and even to track uh, simple things like uh, whether a child has missed her dose of vaccination 
uh, much of this can also be addressed through mobile technology. I think we need to invest more uh, in these types of technologies because this is something that even the poorest man in India has access to in some ways. Um, and I think if we do that, then uh, on the one hand, we can create more awareness, we can create uh, more advocacy, but on the other hand, we can also make sure that those people that actually do enroll in national immunization programs don't drop out, that those dropout rates can be controlled uh, and they can be minimized because in vaccination, what's important uh, is that until and unless a child gets the full course of vaccination, uh, either a two dose or a three dose or a follow up dose, the protection offered by the vaccine is not complete. So that, that becomes really, really important. So I think there are some existing technologies that can be brought in uh, to make a difference and to help address this problem. Next question is from Tarun. According to you, how government can fast track development or of vaccine in epidemic situation? Yes, that's a good question. I think that uh, uh, I think the government can obviously do uh, a number of different things. You know, the government has a lot of resources available available to it. Uh, I would say that to start off, what the government needs is a framework or a policy around preparedness. You know, we need to have a clear set of guidelines that if this country uh, faces a new epidemic or a new outbreak, uh, what is our preparedness program? Uh, what are the guidelines? Uh, what are the policies? What are the procedures? Uh, and, and is that in place? And do all the stakeholders understand uh, that this is the framework that needs to be followed? Uh, I think the second thing is that the the key points within that framework need to be funded, they need to be resourced, they need to be incentivized, uh, and that also becomes important. The third thing, of course, is that uh, because of who we are as a country, our geographical location, uh, there are certain things that we are more exposed to, certain diseases that we are more exposed to than others. So even having a priority list, for example, of you know what what are the top five or what are the top ten diseases that we need to be prepared for? So having those kinds of things in place are really the necessary first step. And obviously, there's much more that needs to be done. I think the good news is that at a global level, in the past one year, we have seen global initiatives uh, that have uh, been launched uh, precisely in this direction. And I think the government can actually uh, pick a few lessons. Uh, there's a few things we can learn from those global initiatives. Uh, and we can actually start implementing uh, those things in our country. Uh, but uh, what I would say is that there are a number of things that can be done. Uh, but to me, I think the primary thing that is required is really a preparedness roadmap uh, and a framework that should we be affected by an emerging epidemic uh, what is the way in which we would try and address that? Uh, and, and, and without that, I think uh, it would be very difficult for us to map out what the subsequent steps and what the details would be. Next question is from Sampath. There are a lot of myths and misconceptions on vaccination, and even today many physicians don't promote vaccination. Even government has less priority on the vaccination. What do you suggest to address this issue? Yes, I, I think I think the observation is correct. I do agree with the observation. This is this is quite true. Um, and uh, if you remember the uh, the slide that I showed, if I could just go back to this particular slide with the pyramid, uh, and so this is a slide that talks about barriers to immunization. And I think that your question can be addressed uh, in this slide. Um, and, and what you see here is really at the top is this issue around patient awareness and, uh, and misunderstanding uh, about vaccines and its uh, side effects. Um, and so I think at a fundamental level, this is, this is what we need to do. Um, and you know, oftentimes when we talk about the eradication, you know, India as a country just went through polio eradication. We were very, very successful in doing that. Um, and being a large country, you know, it's very difficult to accomplish something like polio eradication, and yet we did that. The, the problem with eradication is that until and unless you remove the disease from every 
pocket of our society, uh, the problem is still not solved. And with polio, what we learned is that uh, almost, I would say, 80% of our effort was spent in the final 20% of the population, which was most resistant, uh, that simply did not want their children to receive the polio vaccine. Um, and I think that uh, uh, one of the hallmarks of polio eradication in India was not just the fact that there was a cheap and effective vaccine available, not just because the government of India, the PMO, had made polio eradication a top priority, uh, but we had a, 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 core, a cohort of 2.5 lakh volunteers. We had a very large number of volunteers who actually went from village to village, place to place, uh, pocket to pocket, house to house, you know, educating people, uh, addressing misunderstandings, addressing myths, uh, and it's really when all those things came together that we as a country managed to eradicate polio. I think what we need to do is, is build on our success story of polio eradication and now apply that success story for eradicating uh, additional diseases that uh, kill our children and kill our mothers and our citizens. Uh, and I think that's, that's what's needed. But I would say really at the top of the pyramid, the top of the problem is to create more awareness, more advocacy, uh, clear misunderstandings and, and dispel the myths associated with the use of vaccines. Next question is from Gajendra. What are your, your views on putting a price cap on vaccine to stop hospital overcharging anywhere from 3,000 to 10,000 for rotavirus vaccine? Uh, yes, so this is obviously a, a big problem. Um, and uh, it, it's a, uh, a problem that I think is not just uh, found in the case of vaccines, it's also found in many other medical products uh, as a country we saw what happened with stents very recently and the intervention that the government had to impose on the use of stents um, i think with vaccines i would uh, uh, draw your attention to the fact that the majority of the vaccination in any country including in india actually does not happen through private channels uh, the majority of the vaccination happens through public health channels, in public, uh, public hospitals, community hospitals, uh, through government schemes and government programs. So this is an area where uh, the government actually has a, not only a big role, but the government has a huge control. So that's very different from private practitioners and private hospitals uh, charging uh, an arm and a length to, to deliver vaccines. So I think that in the case of vaccines, uh, if the government can play an even bigger role uh, in making sure that everyone uh, receives the vaccines, then I think that the dependence of people and societies on private sources will, will minimize. And so therefore the incentives for uh, physicians in private hospitals to sell vaccines at a very high price, that incentive will actually go down. So this could be one way. I think the short answer is that if the government does a better job then the private sector will be less incentivized to try and make more money from something that ultimately the government is giving to the public anyway. Next question is from Santanu. For pentavalent vaccine, there are few case reports have been documented. Is there any specific initiative taken to overcome the adverse events following pentavalent vaccination? Yes, so I think that the adverse events that have been observed associated with pentavalent vaccination uh, are very unfortunate. Uh, but I would say a couple of things in that, in that respect. I think the first thing I would say is that uh, pentavalent vaccine uh, as such is extremely safe because pentavalent vaccine has been administered literally to millions if not billions of children around the world. It's, it's one of the most basic vaccines. Uh, that is out there. So the safety profile of this vaccine is 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 uh, incredibly strong. Having said that, I do agree that we have observed some unfortunate uh, incidents of uh, death in children who have received pentavalent vaccine. I think the good news is that in most of these cases, 
uh, there was a quick uh, follow-up, quick action that no more incidents, uh, no more uh, additional deaths occurred. Uh, in those cases where there was a fatality, uh, the vaccination program was stopped, there was, it was investigated, uh, and proper action was taken if there was any negligence um, and, and things like that. So I think those things uh, are really commendable. But what I would say is that uh, when you're looking at uh, pediatric uh, populations, there are children who unfortunately are born with certain congenital conditions. And uh, many of these children, unfortunately, no matter how hard we try, uh, will have a fatality. And that fatality is not necessarily associated with the vaccination. So I think, I think in the case of pentavalent, it was unfortunate that we lost those children. Uh, we should not have. Uh, but uh, the question of whether that was associated with the vaccine or was that uh, an underlying uh, case or an underlying problem uh, is, not, is not really known. Um, and uh, uh, I think what's important to keep in mind is that a, a vaccine such as pentavalent is actually a very safe vaccine. Uh, and just we just need to do a better job to make sure that we screen, we screen the children appropriately so those children who have some pre-existing conditions, that we identify those children and make sure that things don't get worse upon administration of the vaccine. Uh, due to time constraint, we are taking our last question. This question is from Dr. K. Sri Selam. Is the heat stable rotavirus interchangeable with the other existing rotavirus vaccines? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, we don't know yet because uh, we are still finishing up the clinical trials of our heat stable vaccine. Uh, I think that there's a broader question about uh, whether the existing rotavirus vaccines, and we know that there are already rotavirus vaccines that exist in the public health system, the broader question of whether those vaccines are interchangeable or not is being addressed. Um, and I think that, that there is, uh, at least from what we can see, what I can see, there is a good scope. Uh, there's a good scope, there's a good potential for interchangeability. But whether that has been demonstrated yet, we don't know. Uh, we just need additional studies. And once that's done at a broader level, then I see no reason that if interchangeability has been established for existing vaccines, I see no reason why that should not be applicable to the Hilleman Labs heat stable rotavirus vaccine. 